Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and praise the Lord. We thank God and we praise God for this glorious day, this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day in May, the 30th day of the fifth month of the 23rd year of the third decade of this century and third millennium. We thank God for bringing us thus far by faith. We are facing forward in Jesus' name. I hope you have enjoyed the radiance of the sun this day. We are going to attend to the seventh chapter of John. We'll do a little reading this evening. Uh, we will read from verses 1 through 39 as we explore the theme, living water. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-living God, our Savior, our guide, our all in all, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, God, for your goodness and mercy that have guided us and protected us all day long. And we thank you, God, for this moment in time when we can gather and inquire into your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our pathway. We ask you, God, to illumine our way through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to thank God for everyone who is on the line everyone on the virtual platforms, whether you're around the corner or from around the world, we thank and praise God for you tuning in and for your presence in this time of study. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. <clears throat> we will begin at verse 1 and we'll do a little reading tonight. We didn't get a chance to do that uh, Sunday, but uh, we'll go into further detail tonight as we are fresh from Pentecost Day. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. Your version may read a bit differently, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit of God to help us arrive at the same point of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He did not wish to go about in Judea because the Jews were looking for an opportunity to kill him. Now the Jewish festival of booths was near. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one who wants to be widely known acts in secret. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. But your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify against it that it works are evil. Go to the festival yourselves. I am not going to this festival, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone to the festival, then he also went, not publicly, but as it were, in secret. The Jews were looking for him at the festival, saying, where is he? And there was considerable complaining about him among the crowds. While some were saying, he is a good man. Others were saying, no. He is deceiving the crowd, yet no one would speak openly about him for fear of the Jews. About the middle of the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. 
The Jews were astonished at it, saying, How does this man have such learning when he has never been taught? Then Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. Those who speak on their own seek their own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent me or but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent me is true, and there is nothing false in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why are you looking for an opportunity to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus answered them, I performed one work and all of you are astonished. Moses gave you circumcision. It is, of course, not from Moses, but from the patriarchs. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath in order that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me? because I healed a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Now, some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is not this the man whom they are trying to kill? And here he is speaking openly, but they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? Yet we know where this man is from. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he was teaching in the temple, You know me, and you know where I am from. I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true, and you do not know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Then they tried to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many in the crowd believed in him and were saying, when the Messiah comes, he will do more signs than this man has. When the Messiah comes, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer. And then I am going to him who sent me. You will search for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will search for me, and you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart, shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
we say thanks be to God. I wanted to go a little deeper in the theme of living water, and I wanted to give better context for uh, this lesson tonight by reading uh, most of the seventh chapter. As you see, uh, those of you who are following along in your uh, Bibles, you see that the seventh chapter is 52 verses. But we see that Jesus makes the declaration of the Spirit and likens it to living water in the midst of the heat of controversy. If you notice, in the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is having a conversation with his brothers. Now, we typically don't think about Jesus having siblings, but he indeed did. Joseph and Mary subsequently had children, and Jesus had a number of brothers and at least one sister, according to tradition. And in the context of this dialogue that Jesus has with his brothers, his brothers are pushing him to reveal the authenticity of his works and his worth. I'm not quite convinced, and the scripture hints at the fact that his brothers did not even believe that he was who he said he was. Nonetheless, they wanted him to go uh, from where he was in relative obscurity to the great festival, the Feast of the Booths. There were uh, at least three occasions when Jewish men gathered. They were obligated, if they were observant Jews, to go to Jerusalem uh, for great festivals. Three of them, of course, uh, are the Feast of the Booths, which depicts the wilderness wandering of the Israelites and how God miraculously uh, protected them, uh, at least their remnant, and brought them into the land of promise. If you know the story uh, from the book of Exodus uh, none of the original generation except for Joshua and Caleb actually inherited the land of promise. The rest of them uh, died in the wilderness. And uh, there is reason and explanation uh, behind that other than natural attrition. Um, some of those, uh, many of them had not shaken uh, the mentality of enslavement and had given both God and Moses such a tough time <clears throat> that they disqualified themselves from entering the land of promise because of their unfaithfulness, uh, their lack of vision. and uh, But their children, uh, led by Joshua and Caleb, and if you remember, Joshua and Caleb uh, were part of a group of uh, 10 spies that went and actually looked at the promised land while the encampment of the Israelites were in the desert. And they came back and reported to Moses what they saw. And they saw abundance. Uh, they saw great fertility. They saw beauty. Uh, they, they, they saw amazing things, but they saw very, very large people. Uh, they called them giants, and they did not believe that they were a match for them. And they thought that it was better for them to stay in the desert than to go into the promised land. And they had convinced the majority of people that that was to be their lot. And of course, these folks in their anger turned against Moses. They figured that if they couldn't enter the, the promised land because they couldn't defeat the giants that were in the land, Moses should have left them in Egypt. That it was better for them to be enslaved than to die in the desert. 
Now, obviously, these people had uh, a serious case of amnesia. The same God who, with a mighty outstretched hand, delivered them from the wrath and the destruction of Pharaoh was certainly able to bring them into their land of promise. And the only people who believed in that group who were over 40 years of age uh, were uh, Joshua and Caleb. And God permitted them uh, in their uh, relative middle age, or some would say their old age after 40 years, uh, to go into the land of promise. You remember that Moses uh, had a chance to see where uh, the future was, but Moses was not permitted to physically go into the land of promise. His assignment had been completed, and there is speculation that Moses disqualified himself, but that's not quite uh, the rendering that uh, we should take away from that. Uh, it is difficult to lead people under any circumstances. And uh, Moses had his hands full uh, when, when he was given the assignment to be liberator. He was already 80. And when the children of Israel were about to enter into the promised land, at least that next generation, Moses was already 120. And uh, God said, you've done enough. And uh, I'm, I'm going to take you with me. And uh, so uh, that's what happened with Moses. So this was an important festival for the Jews to remember. And of course, as I said, uh, back in those days, uh, the religion was male dominated, uh, even though women uh, passed on life to uh, the Jewish generations. The men were held in higher esteem according to culture and custom and their understanding of the scriptures that were before them. So uh, Jesus was, uh, that was the season in which Jesus was operating. But we also know that there was a Jewish Pentecost. That was another a great festival. But before I even introduce that, let me introduce uh, the Passover. The Passover was the occasion when the Israelites were delivered from bondage. And uh, the last plague that God sent into Egypt, according to scripture, was a plague of death. And uh, it was to strike the firstborn of all uh, who were not covered. And we remember that the covering consisted of the blood of the lamb that was smeared on the doorposts. And uh, when the death angel came into Egypt, the death angel passed over every house that had the marking of the blood of the lamb. Now, you know that uh, if you're a Bible reader and, and if you are connected spiritually, uh, that you can run with that. <laughs> we, even to this day as believers, understand what it means to be covered by the blood of the lamb. So that was an obligatory occasion of pilgrimage where Jews from all over, all of the known world would flock into Jerusalem. But the third great festival was what we call Pentecost. The Jews observed Pentecost before the Christians inherited it. And please keep in mind that the inheritance was really a smooth transaction 
because the original followers of Jesus themselves were Jews. And it was on the day of Pentecost that we received the gift, the unleashing of the spirit of God, the, the very personality of God was stirred up in us. It alighted on us according to Acts chapter two and it spread like wildfire. It came in as a great noise, the rushing of a mighty wind. But the Jewish interpretation of Pentecost was initially an agricultural celebration. The, the first spring harvest was the barley harvest, and it was typically gathered around Passover. Uh, and Passover and Passion Week in the Christian calendar typically coincide. So Passover and what we call Easter or resurrection uh, typically are in the same uh, calendar neighborhood, if you will. They happen around the same time of the year. And the Jews were excited uh, to remember how God was faithful and continued to nourish them and feed them. So they brought the first fruits of their crops and especially the barley. They brought it uh, during uh, Passover and they would uh, also uh, have a great demonstration and celebration. They would take the finest ox. I know we love ox tails, but they would take the finest ox and they would decorate the ox's horns uh, with gold. And they would take an olive garland and put around the head of the oxen. They would adorn the oxen, make the oxen uh, look beautiful, dress the oxen up and, and bring the oxen into Jerusalem. And there would be a great uh, celebration of God's fertility of the earth. But the second uh, harvest came 50 days after Passover. And, and this is where we get the, the Greek word Pentecost. Pente uh, means 50. So 50 days after the first harvest, the second harvest was celebrated, and that was the wheat harvest. And that was the occasion when the Jews gathered from the dispersion, uh, and, and they would come into uh, the temple. Uh, they would come into the city and surround the temple and give God praise and glory. Well, over time, the theme of Pentecost, the Jewish Pentecost changed because with the first destruction of the temple around 586 uh, BCE, uh, they remembered that even if they had material possession, if they did not have spiritual rooting and grounding, uh, they had really nothing. So they began to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. When Moses went up the mountain and received uh, the 10 orders from God that we call commandments. And they worshiped God for giving them a moral compass by which they could be guided by which they could come into fellowship with God. And uh, it became uh, a signal occasion for uh, their, their celebration. It was both solemn, but at the same time, it was joyous because they knew that the word of God was alive and active in their midst and that God had given them a guidepost, a GPS, if you will, on how to live. So Jesus, according to this particular passage of scripture, comes 
at the Feast of the Booths, observing the wanderings, the wilderness wanderings, the tests that uh, the Jewish ancestors of his had to endure in order to be purified and, and made ready for their entrance into the promised land. And, and there was controversy following Jesus. Now, if you read the sixth chapter of John, you'll understand that Jesus uh, had done a miraculous thing. Jesus was full of signs and wonders. He took two fish and five barley loaves and fed a multitude, 5,000 men plus women and children. So we don't know how large that number was. We just call it the feeding of the 5,000. But we have to account for the fact that there were women and there were children that were also fed. Now, after that experience, Jesus uh, gets the attention of those who are intimidated by this new and mighty move of God in their midst. Uh, but they weren't that excited. They weren't that agitated over him feeding folks. But when Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, well, that was a bridge too far. And uh, there were people that wanted to kill him. Uh, we cannot imagine the pressure uh, that he was under. When I was in Liberia, I had a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to uh, access uh, YouTube. And, and I went back into uh, the history of uh, the modern uh, liberation struggle of black people in America called the Civil Rights Movement, Civil Rights Revo or Revolution, whatever you may want to call it. And I was just awestruck that for 13 years, from uh, 1955 uh, to 1968, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King lived in constant, constant threat. And, and it was not just uh, people who were misguided. Uh, some of this was very highly organized. It was very sophisticated. And it wasn't just threats from uh, the homeland. There were people around the world uh, that wanted him to fail because if he succeeded, then black people all over the planet would rise up. <laughs> and would loose their shackles. Uh, we, we don't, this is why it's important to read. This is why it's important to have a sense of history because it gives us context and it gives us a, a sense of purpose and meaning. I know that people just want to reduce uh, Martin Luther King to a few words in a wonderful, wonderful uh, address that he gave uh, at the Lincoln Memorial uh, uh, at, at the mall in Washington, D.C. on the 25th of August, 1963. But uh, we can't reduce Jesus, uh, we can't reduce Martin Luther King to the phrase, I have a dream. Uh, it was far more expansive and, and deeper. People have hijacked it. They have trivialized it. Uh, even his enemies, people that, that don't believe anything that he really stood for, uh, use that phrase or they'll use this phrase. Uh, you can't be judged by the color of your skin, but by the content of your character as they are pulling away every support system, every privilege, every right that everybody ought to have uh, in a multicultural, multiracial democracy. So, so please understand 
uh, that that not only did Martin King go through it for 13 years, for three and a half years, Jesus went through it. And John makes it obvious out of all of the chroniclers of, of the life of Jesus. I mean, John is so explicit. He says on a number of occasions that, and when he says the Jews, he's not uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, I want you to quickly understand that and neither should we be. But we're talking about the leadership of the religion that uh, they did not want the masses of people to be liberated, didn't want them to read, didn't want them to know what was in the Torah, the word of God, who wanted to dictate to them and, and to extort them. Uh, and while they lived in comfort and privilege and luxury, this is what Jesus was up against. And these folks wanted to kill him. We haven't even gotten to the 19th chapter of John when Jesus ultimately paid the sacrifice. But as early as chapter seven, they were hunting for him. And uh, he gave, he, they didn't take his life. <laughs> I, I want you to understand that too. Jesus made himself a sacrifice. He told them explicitly, no one takes my life. I give it. So while they thought that they were doing, they should have left him alone. They should have let him die of old age. Uh, they should have just allowed him to be an esoteric prophet, just fade in the, but he warned them. He said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all unto me. Isn't that what he said? <laughs> I believe it's in John chapter 12. You, you check it out for yourself. So Jesus, before Pentecost, before the Christian Pentecost, before uh, the, the convergence of those who are followers of his way and, and the status quo, Jesus forecast, he said, if you believe in me, he said, if you believe in me, because there were a lot of people, they wanted to believe, but they were afraid to believe. They were afraid and uh, they were intimidated. Uh, they wanted uh, to experience a new way of life. But uh, the people that were running things uh, and running things with such a dispassionate and iron hand uh, were so intimidating. And the average person uh, just, just they didn't want to forsake family. They didn't want to forsake their, their occupation if they had one. They didn't want to forfeit their property. They didn't want to be expelled from the synagogue. I mean, we saw... Uh, in, in the ninth chapter of John, when Jesus heals the man born blind, his parents refused to vouch for him because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. They didn't want to lose their status in the community. They didn't want to be excommunicated. They did not want to become a persona uh, non grata. <laughs> they weren't interested in any of that. So they threw their own son under the bus. This is this this must have been a rough time uh, to to believe. Uh, it it had to be a tough time. And there was belief, and there was faith. And Jesus said that if you believe in me, as the word of God says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Isn't that what Jesus introduced to the woman at the well at Sychar, Jacob's well? Jesus offered her living water. It, 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 is, it is absolutely incredible that uh, the spirit of God is associated with both fire and water. <laughs> ha! 
Lord have mercy, Jesus. I mean, and, and there were people before the the coming of the Spirit uh, in 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 great evidence and and in communal portion who had received individual visitations of the Spirit. No doubt Moses did. I mean, when Moses was tending to Jethro's flock uh, in the book of Exodus, minding his own business, he saw a bush that was simultaneously green and on fire. And, and he had never seen anything like that. Uh, that was a theophany. That was the manifestation of God in nature. And when Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, when Moses drew close to that bush aflame, uh, God spoke and said, you've got to take off your shoes, Moses, if you come any closer, because the ground upon which you're standing is holy. I'm so glad that the spirit of God is not just the prized possession of a few people. And I'm glad that the Spirit of God has been implanted in us. And I know that if we allow the Spirit of God to move within us, uh, there is nothing impossible for God to do through us and with us and for us. This is revolutionary. God wants to give us the same power that God has. <laughs> and, and we've got to be able to handle it. We can't take it and then pretend that we're God. We have to understand that the power we have comes from God. And as long as we keep that in focus and keep that in mind, we'll get more power. Oh my God, I, <laughs> I, 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 I feel the power of God. I, I feel God stretching out. I, I feel the assurance of God. How about you? And it's an amazing thing that God puts at our disposal. Of ourselves, we're not worth it. Of ourselves, we're not worthy. Of ourselves, we do not qualify. But God sees greatness in us because God made us in God's image and in God's likeness. It is the enemy's job to talk us out of our greatness. Talk us out of our inheritance. To talk us out of our spiritual purpose and our standing and our place in God. And I'm just encouraging someone tonight, you've got it, you've got what God wants to give you. The gift is in you, it's on you, it's around you, it's above you, it's beneath you. All you have to do is to tap into it, flow into it, say, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Yeah, I, I, I just wish that somebody, uh, and you, you don't have to comment uh, on, on this platform. That, that's not necessary. But, but I hope that you have some time uh, where you can just have a, a real honest talk with God. Uh, now, if you want to say something, if you want to say hallelujah, if you want to say praise the Lord, I don't want to quench your spirit. You can do all of that, but I, I just want you to tap in to the power of God. Jesus presents it as living water. And, and I just, you know, if I had the King James Version, uh, I, I, would, I would read it. And, uh, but I don't know if I can pull it up that quickly uh, tonight. But uh, I just want to read again what it says in the New Revised Standard Version. It says, 
and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart, and the King James says that out of the believer's belly shall flow rivers of living water. Living water. Living water. Everything about God is about life. Even in what we call death and transition, there is life. Uh, death has got to give way to victory to those who believe. <laughs> For those who believe, when we're dead, we're not done. I wish somebody would help me tonight. I mean, we've got, we've got it going out and coming in. We not only have insurance, we have blessed assurance. That's why we should be living powerful and victorious lives. And uh, I'm not here to put anybody down. I'm not here to beat up on anyone. I'm just here to encourage somebody that you and I can live up to our God-given potential that gives us power and authority. It is, it is recession proof. It is depression proof. It is illness proof. It, I mean, I'm telling you, it, it overcomes the world. We ought to be glad that we're in this season of the Holy Spirit. That's why those who have organized the church year uh, pin the season of the Holy Spirit as the longest season. We use the color green after Pentecost Day because it symbolizes growth, growth in our knowledge and love of the Lord. I pray that for these next uh, 20 or more Sundays, as we celebrate the season of Pentecost, that you and I will grow. It will grow. We'll see the growth. That there, if there's anything that is in our way that is hindering us, anything that is crippling us, anything that is holding us down or holding us back, you and I have living water. We have the spirit of God. We have the passion of God. We have the fire of God. We have the holiness of God. We've got it. We ought to, feel the present, <laughs> excuse me, we ought to feel the presence of God everywhere we turn and everywhere we go. I mean, you, everybody has their moments. Everybody has a, a bout of, of depression. Everybody uh, has a, a time or, or, or a question or, or two uh, about how things are going on. But if you just stay focused, if, if you can, in the words of that great song, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe God has brought me this far to lead me. If you can just stay focused. Ha! Hallelujah. I'm not just uh, speaking to you. I'm speaking to myself. If we can just stay focused, just remember how far God has brought us. Remember all of the jams that God has gotten us out of, all of the ways that God has made, all of the times God has looked beyond our faults, seen our needs and met our needs. If we can just stay focused, Hallelujah. If we can just stay focused, we'll have victory. We'll have victory. We'll have victory. We will have victory by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm not going to bother you anymore tonight. Uh, I, I need uh, to jump off this line uh, in a few minutes. 
but I, I pray that our time together has has helped and, and has strengthened and has encouraged. We are in the season of the Holy Spirit. And Sunday, we're going to talk about uh, our everything God. Because I know that there is uh, tension in the body of Christ over the, the idea of the Trinity. But I pray that the Lord will give me power to unpack that luggage <laughs> Sunday. If you want a sneak preview, just go to uh, Matthew 28 and read verses 16 through 20. Uh, and hopefully that'll help. But we thank and praise God for this time together. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. And we praise you. Thank you that you have not left us orphaned. Thank you that you have not left us bereft of the tools that we need to live victorious and abundant lives. Thank you, God, that you've given us power over sin and even over self. We thank you and we praise you, God. We've got a remedy and an answer for the enemy. We thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Holy One. We accept this gift. Fill our cups, Lord. We lift them up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in our souls. Bread of heaven, feed us till we want no more. Fill our cups. Fill them up and make them whole. We thank you and we praise you, God, for touching, healing, delivering, raising bowed down heads, drying tear-stained eyes, giving us reason to carry on. We thank you. We thank you for healing. We thank you for health. Uh, we thank you, God, for comfort and security. And we wish these things, we, we pray for these things for everyone on this planet. We don't want it just for ourselves. We want everybody to enjoy the fullness of God. So have your way. Give us a peace spirit all over this planet. Help us to study war no more. Yes, God, we remember those who paid the ultimate price to secure our way of life in this land. We pray for a time, God, and we can beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. We will study war no more. Do it for your glory. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We magnify you and we adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God and thank God. You're going to hear this song throughout the season of Pentecost. I'll never forget the very, very first time I heard this song. I mean, it blessed me, and it is a wonderful prayer song. And I thank God for inspiring Bishop Paul Morton. Uh, don't do it without me. God, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without us. Listen and be blessed. Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, <laughs> please don't do it without me. Is that your prayer? Don't do it without me. You got to tell it for yourself.
Sister Gail King, happy birthday. I know that you had a birthday a few days ago, and I pray that you are enjoying your birthday season. Yeah, don't, don't just celebrate one day. <laughs> Listen, every day is a birthday. Every day is a day of Thanksgiving. Every day is resurrection. Every day, every day. My God. All right, good people, enjoy the rest of your evening. If you want to jump on the fellowship line Thursday night, help yourself at 7 p.m. on the conference call line. Join us for prayer Friday evening, 7 p.m. Uh, join us Sunday morning in person. 
or uh, virtually. You know you can't come down Jefferson Sunday uh, because there will be race cars on the street. <laughs> so if you're coming, uh, map out another way and all will be well. But we will be in the house on the first Sunday of June, by God's grace, talking about the Holy Spirit of God. Love you all and have a wonderful night. God bless.